Okay, that's a very tough act to follow, huh? <laughs> I was asking him what is the favorite rock band of the Russians because that he could be a junior Rosenthal. Maybe. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on something that is so, so familiar with you by now, the drug war in the Philippines, uh, to indicate, to illustrate the narrative of divisions, uh, conflict, policy discourse in the Philippines right now. I think, uh, first off, I'd like to say that before you had your Trump, we had our Rodrigo Duterte. And yeah. possibly, also, he would beat the Trump any time in the Time Magazine's most influential persons of the world list. <laughs> That's because so many Filipinos voted for him, perhaps. Okay, so uh, the possibility is that you've seen this photograph. It's uh, appeared in many of the newspapers in the U.S. This came from a Philippine newspaper. It's a real picture, not the Pieta uh, uh, image that you see in many churches. But this woman is holding on to her husband who was killed in a drug war operation by the Philippine police. Our president called it too dramatic. Uh, these are people rounded up for uh, investigation by the police, all of them suspects. As you can see, there are supposedly some samples of uh, drug paraphernalia that had been seized from them. The question really is, it's the flip side to innocent until proven guilty. What's happening now is that people are deemed guilty before they could be proved innocent. There are people who had just been uh, found by the wayside, some of them with masking tapes over their faces, their hands and legs tied, or some in garbage bags. The bodies of uh, suspected, I stress, suspected drug users and pushers are littering the streets of uh, our country too many, too often at night or even daytime. And yet, this is a photograph that had appeared in the international press about how congested Philippine jails are, about 1,500% more than capacity. And this is where, actually, they would be bringing these numbers of uh, people, very confused for now. It's supposedly about 4 million drug users or drug dependents in the Philippines. We have a population of 102 million, uh, 16,000 uh, family ho households, it's 16 million households in the Philippines, but also 20% uh, of our people living in poverty or earning less than $1.50 a day. So our president says we have 4 million drug dependents. Our drug enforcement agency says it's 1.7 million. I think our president's very bad with math because he adds those who had surrendered to the official data, so 1.7 plus a million over who had been surrendered or been coaxed to surrender, that makes it 4 million. So by now, as of January 31, these are the numbers that define the very tragic harvest of the drug war of our president from July 2016 to the present, all in a span of about eight months. Casualties, 7,080 persons killed, including According to the police, 2,500 suspected drug users and dependents killed in police operations and many more, about 4,000 killed in operations not yet clear who the suspects were except that they are vigilantes or unidentified armed groups. Very few investigated cases by now, so that would mean actually failure on the part of the police as well. 922 victims of cases the investigation had finished out of about 4,000 by vigilantes. Arrested, 53,000 persons. You will be surprised what the word surrenderists mean. People had been coaxed to visit their, their uh, village uh, offices, their village officials, so that they could sign up and uh, clear their names because they're supposedly on a watch list of drug users and dependents and a million houses visited by the police to flush out so-called users and pushers. This is the guy behind it all. What do you think is wrong with this story? He was a mayor of Davao City, a capital, a city that's uh, in southern Philippines, uh, undefeated in all the elections he had participated in for over 32, 30 years, actually, mayor and member of Congress. He won as a president of the Philippines in May 2016 
at a time when many other rivals were from the elite families who had been associated with uh, actually the, the former president, Benigno Aquino III. So this president has been called the Punisher or calls himself the Punisher and has been called Dirty Harry of the Philippines. He curses, he curses, he disrespects women, but he communicates quite well with the Filipino masses, I would say, because the numbers are, his trust rating is quite high, actually three times higher than Trump has in the U.S. His disapproval rating is a very low 7%, distrust rating just 5%, Undecided Filipinos, 15%. This is as of the latest public opinion survey, March 2017. His approval rating by socioeconomic classes highest in the ABC group of affluent families, uh, quite low in the D and E groups of the uh, people in living in poverty conditions. So the pictures would give you cause to wonder, why are the figures falling this way, still in his favor? Actually, the problem is uh, the rule of law is very weak in the Philippines and the criminal justice system is quite slow. Drugs are a problem that resonates with many households in the Philippines who know of a friend or a neighbor or a son or a daughter or a relative who had been into it and had been pushed to desperation because there's no more solution in sight. So this president offers them some hope, the desperation, Filipinos who wanted something done. Uh, because rule of law is very weak, he had managed to do as he did in Davao City, repeat the deployment of police officers to just arrest, and he says, if they should resist, kill them. So uh, now, there is a very long history of human rights activism in the Philippines, but the problem with human rights activism in the Philippines is that we have been too focused on civil and political rights. Uh, criminal justice system rights or issues have not taken root in the Philippines and that is why we think it, is, it has been the weakness of our effort to tell uh, our citizens that there is such a thing as due process, you should look at warrants of arrest, you should look at search warrants to be very clear that you are the subject of such operations. There have been, for the longest time, very broken institutions in the Philippines. Our police do very bad work. The military, the courts, the legislature, very compromised. And of course, for the longest time, politics of patronage has been the culture in the Philippines. There are 80 provinces in the Philippines, and in all this, you have political clans dominating election after election for the longest time. And suddenly, there was a switch when this president came in from very open institutions and processes to now very opaque processes and institutions. Okay, the challenge, how do you do journalism in this situation? First off, we thought that first we must really plan very well what we can do given this situation. It's very difficult to just say that, you know, ignore this president, he doesn't do good conversation, he doesn't deal with the issues, he just curses and is so full of himself. But the point is, we're not communicating with the president alone, but with the citizens. So we thought, first problem, we have so many single source stories, and the single source would be just the police. Uh, the usual doesn't work anymore. The, the choices, the sources, the voices, the events are very new ones. We need to connect the docs and data. We have not been used to having a database of the criminal justice system, as in monitoring the drug war, or monitoring uh, how the police has been doing its uh, investigation of unidentified uh, vigilantes. We need to check and challenge and validate, look at subtext and context of stories, and report more and better. So I'll give you just a long, well, some sample of what we do. This is month one of the campaign. Already we were counting 1,800 dead. That is on average about six persons, 60 persons of the 30 days being killed per day to illustrate how bad it is. We looked at the need to question the assumptions of the state. So it's saying 4,000 people had surrendered. Oh, no, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, but where are these people? So we, you have to locate them in the regions and you will see that in some regions there are operations, in others none. 
we have to look at persons killed. So zero for some of the regions and many for the others. We have to look at the most vulnerable, the children and the women. We did special attention to their cases. But some children as young as 6 to 12 years old, they had been listed as drug pushers and runners because in the Philippines, the drug law is for every 10 grams and up of marijuana or uh, shabu, you will live a life in jail. Single penalty for all sorts of crime. So, and then we wanted to find out what are the hidden rules or executive orders defining this drug war. What happens to drug surrenderies? There are templates and forms that the police had done to require people to rat on their neighbors. Like who is the source of your drugs? Where does he live? What is his occupation? Where does he get his money? And then finally, we thought this is something so, so important. There is cash rewards table for policemen who will arrest and also uh, cause the surrender of, uh, of uh, suspects for all sorts of drugs. Um, we, we were thinking, does the crime index really improve? I mean, or does it go down when this drug war has been launched? It doesn't because we don't have drugs as an index crime in the Philippines. We still have cattle rustling, however. So, and then we thought that one of the things we can do is work with lawyers to let people know about their rights when they are arrested, when they're salvaged or victims of summary execution, or they fear that they would be when there are search operations. I think it's important to find out as a parting shot that, you know, journalism is never an easy thing. In a country like the Philippines, where since 1986, 152 journalists had been murdered, and mostly by state forces or private armed groups of local warlords. But this is something so, so different. Uh, in the name of the rights of the people to progress and democracy, the saying that it's all right to kill and violate rights. I think it's a tide of dark populism that's engulfing our nation, as it is also the situation in many countries of the world. But we have a saying in the PCIJ, where I work, that, you know, who blinks first loses. And we always have to strive to live to write another day. Thank you very much.